Well, thank you for that, uh, that introduction, Chong Kong. Um, not too embarrassing. <laughs> uh, could have been worse. And thank you uh, all for coming today. Uh, one or two of you are standing. There, there, I think there's some, some seats in the front if you, if you are looking for a seat. So as advertised, uh, I'd like to talk about financial crises. And of course, since the financial crisis of 2007, 2008 was so important, it's natural to, uh, to think of that as the event th to concentrate on. But in fact, what I want to do is to look beyond that particular financial crisis because uh, historically, there have been many financial crises uh, going back hundreds of years. Uh, there was a particularly bad one in the, late, in the early 18th century, uh, the South Sea Bubble, uh, which in, in many ways was much worse than the, than the crisis that we just went through. At least it was worse for the countries involved. Uh, for reasons that I will come to, uh, we're probably never going to be able to limit crises altogether. Uh, and that's in part because each new crisis is a, a little bit different from the crises that came before. And so you can take actions to fix the problem that caused the last one, but that those actions may not entirely stop the, the next one. Uh, and as I will argue, we may not even want to prevent all crises because to do so would be to take such conservative action that economic uh, innovation would be slowed uh, to, to, a, to an unacceptable level. Uh, what we can do, uh, and this will be the main emphasis of my talk, is to improve uh, the limits that we place on crises. So, so the big problem of the crisis of 2002-2008 was that it was allowed to spread and envelop virtually the entire financial system. It started in, one, in just one part of the financial system, the mortgage uh, loan part of the system, and actually just a small part of that. It was the subprime mortgage loan part. But uh, for reasons I will come to, it ended up uh, bringing the entire financial system almost to a standstill. And that, I will argue, it was unnecessary. And there, there are things we can do to stop that from happening. So uh, here are the topics I'd like to cover. First, why, why is the financial market, why is the credit market so different from most other markets? In the credit markets, every so often, there's one of these uh, meltdowns or near meltdowns. That doesn't happen in most other markets that we, that we deal with. And uh, it's important to understand uh, why it happens with credit and not these other markets. Another important difference is that uh, for the credit market to go back to normal functioning, you often need substantial intervention by central banks. In this last, uh, in this last crisis, the Federal Reserve in the United States the uh, European Central Bank in Europe were major players in, in, in trying to get the economy going again. Uh, there are problems that go wrong in other markets from time to time, but we don't typically need a, a lot of uh, government intervention to get those markets back on track. And, and, so, and the question is, why not? What's different about credits? 
And then uh, third, uh, I want to discuss, as I already mentioned, what we can do before a crisis gets started to try to either stop it altogether or at least limit its effects. Now, before I get into that, uh, I should talk about a few factors which are often discussed if you read the newspaper or you watch television, they're often discussed as uh, important elements of a crisis, uh, but I would argue are not really central to uh, the cause of the cause of crises. Uh, so, what are, what are these non-essential elements? Uh, first is irrationality. So, so if you look at the the, the previous uh, crisis, the, the big crisis of 2007-2008, uh, you could see quite a lot of irrationality in the sense that uh, there were bankers who were trying to make loans to borrowers they knew were never going to, pay these, never going to repay these loans because uh, these borrowers uh, were too poor. So it, it, it looked pretty irrational to try to make the loans. And it also seemed pretty irrational on the part of the borrowers to, 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 uh, to take loans which they couldn't pay back since they would then lose their houses or would lose whatever it was that they, were, that they had made the loan for. So um, th there's plenty of irrationality uh, observed in that crisis. Nevertheless, I would argue we would have had a a serious crisis even without that kind of irrationality. And so the irrationality is not central to the crisis. In the same way that panic clearly played a role uh, when Lehman Brothers failed in 2008, uh, that clearly caused a panic. There was a credit crunch within, uh, within a few days. But again, uh, even even without Lehman Brothers failing, uh, a lot was already going wrong and probably still would have gone wrong. So the panic was not, was not crucial to the crisis. Sometimes argued that the, that the problem that we saw uh, in the most recent crisis was that bankers were too greedy. Uh, that, that's a claim which I find difficult to evaluate because on the one hand, we celebrate bankers who are ambitious and who are trying to, uh, to, uh, to make loans to fund innovative activity. On the other hand, we, uh, we castigate bankers who are making loans be just to make money. Very difficult to... Uh, to, to draw a line between the two. What is the, the line between uh, ambition and greed? We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't really know how to draw, how to draw that line. So uh, I don't think of greed as, uh, as a critical factor in the creation of fin financial crises. What about lack of ethics? Well. Uh, we saw uh, some pretty shady characters uh, in that crisis. Uh, Warren Buffett has this expression that it, it's only when the tide goes out that you see who is swimming naked, uh, who, 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 is, who, is, who is not behaving himself. Uh, and, and that's true. Uh, but I would argue that the problem wasn't so much that people were violating the rules, but that the rules themselves were not set up well for the system to operate. And I, I will be talking about those rules uh, a bit later on. Then there are people who blame uh, the crisis on macroeconomic instability, the fact that there was too much consumption in the United States, not enough consumption in China, um, and uh, it can 
you can make the case that, that both of these things were true, uh, but it's uh, difficult to see how uh, su uh, such a, uh, a discrepancy could cause a crisis. For that matter, we still have overconsumption in the US, and uh, we still have oversaving in China, maybe not as much as before, uh, but we still have this discrepancy, and yet we're not in a financial crisis anymore. So the, the macroeconomic explanation doesn't, doesn't seem right. Sometimes the crisis is blamed on the fact that there were these very complicated mortgage-backed derivatives uh, that were created, and there, and there certainly were such derivatives, and they certainly helped to spread the crisis farther than it might have gone otherwise. But the derivatives didn't cause the crisis in the first place. For the derivatives um, to have some effect, there had to be some more central cause which the derivatives helped bring to the peripheries of the financial system. So I don't blame derivatives as a central cause. Sometimes it's uh, the, uh, the uh, crisis is blamed on the bankers and the fact that bankers were being rewarded to, to, uh, to make bad loans. Uh, I would argue that the, that the problem wasn't so much that bankers were getting loans, uh, getting bonuses for making loans, but they weren't being punished for loans that went bad. So yes, there was a problem with bonuses, but it wasn't the, f the fact that bankers were getting rich that per se was the problem. It was the structure of the uh, bonus system, and I, I'll have more to say about that. And then and finally, uh, you hear this phrase, banks that are too big to fail, and how somehow we were the victim of banks that were too big to fail. As you will see, um, I don't believe in the too big to fail argument. I, I don't think that the problem was that banks were too big to fail. In fact, uh, I'm going to argue that the, facts that the fact that there were some big banks really didn't matter all that much. Uh, th th there may be some arguments against having big banks, uh, but um, they were not the central problem. And in fact, there were countries like Canada. Can Canada is a country where almost all the banks are big, and yet they had no bank failures at all. So, so it's not bigness per se that's, that's the problem. Uh, or there, there, might be, there might be a problem with bigness, but it's a very limited problem, which I will come to later on. So now that I've discussed about all of the things that were not wrong, what, what, what do I think really was wrong? Well, why, are, why is the credit market different? And there, there are, there are really three things that I want to emphasize. Uh, the, the first is... Uh, is, is a pretty much obvious remark, which is that uh, the credit market, unlike most other markets, really is essential for the rest of a modern economy to function. You can have, you can have an economy without potatoes, unless you... Uh, you're really fond of potatoes. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are reasonably good substitutes for potatoes. Uh, and if, if there's a crisis for potatoes, it's not going to bring down the market for automobiles. Uh, but if you have a crisis in the credit markets, if the credit market doesn't work, then enterprises in all markets are going to have trouble functioning. They're going to have trouble making investments. They're going to have trouble meeting their payrolls. So uh, that's, that's an important distinction of the credit market that is essential basically for all aspects of economic activity, whereas potatoes are not. 
So th that's, a, that's a pretty obvious uh, distinction. A, mo a more subtle distinction is that with the credit market, we see that a small shock, a small problem, um, can be magnified and turned into a big problem. Uh, and that, again, is different from the potato market. Uh, sometimes, because of a problem with weather, uh, a potato crop might fail someplace, and that will cause some potato growers to go out of business. <clears throat> That's not going to cause other potato growers elsewhere to go out of business. Actually, quite the contrary. It'll probably help those other uh, potato growers. Uh, but if we look at the credit market, we often see that if some banks fail, that very well might cause other banks to fail too. So that, that's, that's an important difference between the credit market and the potato market. A s small number of bank failures can become a large number of bank failures. A small number of potato failures does not become a uh, large number of potato failures. And I'll explain uh, why we have this difference uh, in a few minutes. And in a, a related thing I wanted to, to, to discuss is the idea that the credit market is not self-correcting in the way that many other markets are. Uh, but the potato market is self-correcting. If some potato growers uh, fail because of, of crops going bad, well, there'll be some other potato growers who will step into the breach and increase production, and that will resolve the, the potato crisis. There's no need for government intervention. Uh, with banks, by contrast, if you have some banks fail, well, that, as I was arguing, can cause even more banks to fail. You can end up with the credit market getting stuck in, a, in what's called a credit crunch, where no banks are willing to lend. We had a credit crunch in 2008, uh, and it didn't uh, self-correct. That is, you, you, you needed a lot of intervention by central banks to resolve that credit crunch. Um, so I'd like to spend a fair amount of time on these, on these second and third points. Uh, they're, they're really the heart of the story, uh, why it is that credit markets are so different from ordinary markets, and why uh, uh, credit markets require outside intervention to get back on track, unlike uh, most other markets. So, uh, so let me elaborate on points two and three. Uh, and excuse me uh, for talking about potatoes all the time. Uh, I, I like potatoes, but I, I, I pick them only uh, because uh, there are such famous historical examples of Pota potato crops being subject, subjected to, uh, to shocks. So, so this is not just a theoretical example, it's, it's actually a historical example. So let's, let's examine what happens when a potato crop gets wiped out someplace. There, uh, there, there was uh, a famous period in the mid-19th century where virtually all the potatoes in Ireland got wiped out by blight. Well, the immediate uh, effect of, uh, was that uh, since potato output was now a good deal lower than it was expected to be, uh, the price of potatoes, the, the world price of potatoes, uh, went up very significantly. So that was the first effect. But uh, that wasn't the only effect, because with these higher prices, 
it became more attractive to grow more potatoes because you were going to get a higher price for them. And so this encouraged outputs in other countries. In particular, Slovakia uh, was induced to grow and sell more potatoes, and, 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 it, did, and it did just that. So uh, ultimately, the initial problem, which was not enough potatoes, was corrected. And it was corrected precisely because the market was allowed to work on its own. Uh, the price rise was a signal that there should be more production, and, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, of course, the crop failure uh, caused some harm in the short run because these higher prices meant that some consumers weren't able to afford potatoes or they couldn't afford very many potatoes. Uh, there, there was uh, some pain created by this crisis in the potato market, uh, but it was short-lived. And, and it, uh, in, after the response, the supply response, things were more or less back to normal. The effect of the blight was mitigated in the long run. Uh, and, and there wasn't any need for the government to get involved. In fact, um, governments sometimes did get involved uh, because they didn't really understand the process that I'm describing. Uh, they were well-intentioned. They, they didn't get involved uh, simply to cause trouble, but they did cause trouble. Uh, they did things like they put, uh, this is a very common reaction, uh, potato prices went up dramatically because there was suddenly a potato shortage. So the government said, oh, you're not allowed to raise your price of potatoes above a, uh, a certain level. That would be gouging consumers. That would be price gouging. And so they put a cap on the potato price, or they, or they taxed the, the, the windfall profits that potato producers would now be earning. Well, that's that sounds as though they were trying to help consumers, and they were trying to help consumers, but notice that it was exactly the wrong thing to do to try to correct the potato problem, because it discouraged the very expansion of outputs that was needed in order to correct for the crop failure. So uh, government intervention not only was not needed in, in this case, uh, but it, it actually made things worse. So what about the credit market? I would argue that there's a sense in which the credit market is just the opposite. Uh, and, and here's why. Uh, let, let me give you a, a very uh, pared down, very simplified, or maybe oversimplified uh, description of how the credit market, market works. Credit market starts with entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs have ideas for how to make something, uh, how, to, how to create a new good, uh, but they don't have the money to put this new idea into effect. So they go to banks. And I'm going to use the term bank as any financial institution which uh, makes loans to entrepreneurs. Banks uh, could include things like, uh, like hedge funds or or uh, private equity firms, all of those I'm going to put under the heading of, of banks. Uh, and they, uh, banks do have money, they have some money, and they also have the ability, at least to some degree, to evaluate ideas. So they know which entrepreneurs they should support and which uh, do not deserve support. And, and they uh, lend money to, to good ideas. But, so that's, 
That's the first pass at describing the financial system, but it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than that because uh, usually a bank will not have enough money to finance all of the good ideas that it um, comes across. So what banks typically do is they borrow money themselves from other banks or from other investors in order to make loans to entrepreneurs. They'll put some of, some of their own money, but a lot of the money will be borrowed from someone else. Uh, and in fact, they have a strong incentive to structure their loans this way. This is what's called taking on leverage, when you're putting in uh, a fair amount of other people's money. Uh, you're putting in a fair amount of borrowed money not just your own money. And the reason why uh, leverage is good for banks is that it allows them to increase their returns. Uh, and here's a, a little example to illustrate that. Uh, suppose that by putting money into a particular entrepreneur, you can get a 20% return from that entrepreneur's activity. Uh, well, if the bank puts $100 of its own money in, into the entrepreneur's idea, uh, it expects to get back $120. That's a 20% return. But suppose that in addition to putting in its own money, it borrows $900 from other banks, and it also puts that $900 into the entrepreneur's idea. Now, altogether, it's going to be getting back $1,200. It's put in $1,000, uh, including the $900 from the other banks. Gets a 20% return on the $1,000, so it gets back $1,200. It has to pay off the banks that it was borrowing from, so we subtract $900 from, from that. Uh, and there's $300 left over for the bank. So now it's, it's made a 200% return on its $100 investment. That's the power of leverage. It, it, it's the power to increase returns. So that's why banks are very happy to use leverage. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's not just good for the bank. It's good for the whole economy because it means that more good ideas can be funded. If banks can borrow money in order to fund ideas that, they, that they've identified, well, then more money can be put into these good ideas. And, and, and we're all better off as a result. We get more growth. We get more innovation. So leverage, uh, leverage is a very useful way of uh, increasing the power of new ideas. But there's a problem with leverage. There's a hitch. Uh, and that hitch comes from the fact that, so far, I've omitted an important factor in the story. And that factor is risk. I've talked about investments as though there's no uncertainty about them. Uh, you put you put $100 in, you get $120 back. It's, it doesn't work that way. Ide new ideas are typically not sure things. There's a reasonable chance they'll pay off, and, and that's why you invest in them. But there's also some chance that they will, won't will work out at all, and in which case you won't, you won't get anything back. Uh, so risk is, is really an essential part of the credit market. It, it, it's what makes, uh, it, it, it again separates uh, the credit market from the potato market. There, there may be risks in the potato market too, but they are not so central 
to the way that the, uh, the market operates. You can think of financing a new, uh, a new idea as a bet. Uh, it, it, you are, uh, you are betting that the outcome will be good, uh, but you understand that uh, it might not work out the way you were, uh, you were hoping. <clears throat> now, once you combine leverage and risk, uh, you've got um, a possibly dangerous combination, because leverage increases risk. Uh, if you invest $100 of your own money and the loan doesn't work out, well, you've lost $100, uh, and you, uh, you may uh, be sorry about that, but, uh, but it, I mean, you knew that, it, that that could happen, and presumably you took that into account when you made the loan in the first place. <clears throat> but if you've also invested $900 of other people's money, now you've lost $1,000 uh, if the bet doesn't work out. So leverage means you end up losing much more money uh, than you would if you were only investing your own money. Uh, and a, a bank that is highly leveraged could fail if it, you, if it loses a, uh, just one or two big bets. And that's exactly what happened to Lehman Brothers. Uh, it lost because of its leverage, very high le leverage position. So what it, so why is leverage, why does leverage make risk so dangerous? Uh, Here's the problem. If the bank makes a loan and the loan goes bad and that causes the bank to fail, that would be not a big problem if the problem didn't go beyond the original bank. Uh, after all, it, it, it was taking a calculated risk, and the risk didn't work out. Uh, it just has to accept that uh, you know, that's part of the game. Sometimes you lose. And maybe sometimes you even go out of business. But the problem is that if, you, if you're highly leveraged, uh, the fact that you are going out of business might imply that other banks have to go out of business too, because you're not able to repay them. They're, now they're in financial trouble, and we can in fact have a chain reaction of failures. A problem that starts small can spread and affect more and more banks through leverage. So, so leverage is the device that turns a small problem into a large problem. We, uh, we call this large problem systemic risk. So, so leverage creates systemic risk, the possibility uh, that the entire system, through leverage, might be affected by what was originally a fairly small problem. And, and so now we, we see uh, a central way in which the credit market differs from the potato market. Uh, as I was arguing, the small problem in the credit markets can spread and become a big problem. Uh, we, that cannot happen with, in the potato market. The small problem there uh, gets self-corrected by other potato producers uh, stepping in and increasing production when there's a potato shortage. Uh, so bank, the credit market's not self-correcting, the potato market is. And notice that in this story I've told, uh, 
I haven't had to appeal to panics or irrational responses or greed or unethical behavior. All of the participants in the credit market are behaving exactly the way that economists typically say they behave. They're, they're just out to maximize their, their payoffs. So it's not a problem with them that causes this credit, uh, the, the, this credit crisis. It's a problem with the credit market itself. And so I'd like to spend some time talking about what we can do to stop this from happening. And, it, and again, it's not to change uh, the objectives of bankers or to teach them to be more rational. It's not to try to affect their behavior. It's to try to make the rules of the credit markets uh, more reasonable. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an, going to be an effort in market design, get, getting the, or mechanism design to get the market to, uh, to have a set of rules that work better. Uh, Notice that if a bank is leveraged and it's making highly risky loans, then to use terminology from economics, it's imposing a negative externality on other banks. An externality is an effect that you have on someone else that you don't take account of because it doesn't affect you. It affects them. Uh, and it, a negative externality is, is one which affects the other banks negatively. Uh, we know uh, we know that uh, externalities don't come because agents are irrational or unethical or greedy. They come out of ordinary optimizing behavior. Uh, but markets with externalities typically don't function very well on their own. And a good example of a market that doesn't function very well on its own, because there's an externality, is the uh, market for clean air. Now, you might not even think there is a market for clean air, because it, uh, where can you go to buy clean air? Uh, I, uh, I haven't seen any clean air shops on my way over here. Well, actually, there is a market for clean air, but it works so badly because of the externalities involved that you scarcely see it. Uh, let me give you an example of uh, where, where, where we do see it a little bit. Um, imagine that there is a laundry right next door to a steel, a steel plant. Steel plant is uh, exuding a lot of black smoke uh, in its production process. This is not good for the laundry, which is trying to get clothes clean right next door. Um, and so uh, the laundry might go to the steel plant and say, look, if you reduce your smoke, uh, I'll pay you a fee. Uh, and, so, and, and things like this often happen uh, in practice. And that is a clean air market. The, the, the laundry is buying clean air from the steel plants. Uh, why don't we see more of that? Well, the, the, the complication is um, that the smoke doesn't just affect this laundry. It affects many other laundries, many other enterprises. Every time one of these enterprises comes to the steel plant and says, I will pay you something if you, if you reduce your smoke, it's 
conferring a benefit on all of the other enterprises that are hurt by the smoke. In other words, most of the benefit from reducing smoke is not going to the laundry that's paying for it. It's going to the other laundries or the other enterprises that, that, don't, uh, uh, that, are, that are harmed by the, by the steel plant smoke. So any given steel plant, uh, any given laundry, doesn't have the incentive to reduce the smoke by very much, because most of the benefit of that reduction is going to someone else. It's what's called a free rider problem in economics. Uh, and it means that each laundry is going to be underpaying to reduce uh, smoke reduction. Uh, we're not going to. Uh, we're not through this uh, through this smoke reduction market going to reduce smoke by as much as it should be reduced, because every every laundry is going to be free riding on other laundries. So what is the solution? How do how do we get clean air when the clean air market works so badly? Well, we get it because the government comes in. The government comes in and either limits the, uh, how much smoke emissions the steel plant can create or fines the steel plant by according to how much smoke it puts out. It, it intervenes in the clean air market. Well, by the same arguments, by, by analogy with the clean air market, we, we also have an externality in the credit market. Uh, the credit market generates uh, too much risk and too much leverage relative to what is good for the economy as a whole. Uh, I would argue that this requires two interventions uh, to solve the problem. Uh, one intervention it occurs after a crisis has already started, uh, after banks have already got into trouble. That's ex post intervention. Uh, but we can do what we can to try to start to, uh, to try to stop a crisis from happening in the first place. That's ex ante intervention. And I would argue we, we need both both ex-ante and ex-post intervention to get the credit market working properly. Um, and let me, um, let me explain why. Let me start with ex-post intervention. So imagine that uh, even though you might have taken measures to try to uh, stop uh, crises, one, one uh, started anyway. Uh, so you, you've had a number of bank failures. What can you do? Uh, well, if some banks get into trouble, what you can do is bail them out. Uh, and by that, I mean you can give them the capital they need so they can continue to, to operate. Uh, we saw plenty of this in the recent financial crises. Uh, in fact, in the United States, where this was critical to the, uh, to the operation of the credit market, it was only because of these bailouts that many banks were able to continue to function. It was critical to the, uh, to the survival of banks, uh, but uh, Politicians didn't explain why this was so important. They, they didn't explain it very well. And now, uh, some years later, the public is furious that these banks were bailed out. Why should they be bailed out where they, as consumers who might have lost their homes, uh, were not bailed out? Uh, the, one, one, uh, one problem 
uh, that the U.S. is facing, uh, other countries that did, uh, did this uh, are facing, is they, they were not very good economics teachers. Uh, they didn't explain what, uh, why bailouts might be the only option in, in, uh, under certain circumstances. And the, the point is, the, the, the point of the bailout is actually not so much to save the banks that have actually already failed. I mean, they, those banks calculated uh, that they had a risk and they, and they, uh, and they lost their bets, and they, they, don't, uh, they don't need to be saved for their own sake, but they do need to be saved because of leverage. Because there's leverage, if they fail, other banks will fail, and it's primarily to prevent the other banks who are not yet in trouble, but will be in trouble if the first banks fail, that we need bailouts. So it's, it's to try to stop this domino effect, this uh, tsunami of uh, bank failures, that bailouts are so important. This, sadly, was, has still not really been explained very well to American voters, and so it's playing a uh, it's playing an unfortunate role in the current presidential campaign in the U.S. and I'm I'm sure that it's played a similarly unfortunate role in other countries' po political discussions too. But it, as you see, it's a very simple idea, uh, not so difficult to explain. Now there is a problem with bailouts. Uh, uh, their bailouts do come at a cost. And the cost is that if you're a bank uh, that anticipates that it will be bailed out if it gets in trouble, well, then you're not going to worry about the riskiness of your loans very much, and you're not going to worry about how highly you're leveraged. And so, ironically, uh, bailouts make the risk and leverage problem worse than it otherwise would be. This is what's called moral hazard. Uh, so just having a bailout policy alone is probably a bad thing. Well, you might, it might be necessary to keep the banking system going, but it, it, it's certainly a bad thing from the standpoint of banks' incentives because it encourages more bad behavior on their part. Uh, and in fact, if you just had this bailout policy, you would probably have more crises than you otherwise would. So you don't want to have just an, an ex-post policy you also want to have ex-ante intervention. And what form should that take? Well, this is, again, a mechanism design issue. Uh, but uh, since leverage, since it's essentially the leverage that's causing the problem, the most direct, the most effective regulation is on leverage. What you, you, what you want is regulation uh, which uh, reduces the amount of leverage. You could also impose higher standards uh, on loans. So, so uh, the, the most recent crisis started because banks were making loans to borrowers who were not very creditworthy. These were the so-called uh, subprime mortgage loans. Um, one form of regulation which would have stopped that uh, would, would, have had, would have been minimum standards for loans. Uh, but uh, so minimum standards are one form of regulation. Uh, that means that borrowers have to be sufficiently creditworthy to get a loan at all. Uh, but I think uh, 
uh, an even more effective form of regulation is to put limits on leverage, or to put it another way, to impose capital requirements on a bank which limit the amount of other people's money the bank is putting into the loan. Remember, it's the other people's money that's causing the problem. It's the other people's money that's causing the chain reaction. So the less of other people's money there is in a given bank's loan, the less chain reaction we're going to get. Now there are, uh, I, actually this slide is the, is the critical form of ex-ante regulation. Uh, if, if you do just these two things, you've probably already done enough to deal with uh, the major threat of, the, with the major threat of a, of a financial crisis. Uh, and it's interesting to note that some countries did that quite well. So, so Canada, I, I mentioned Canada before, uh, Canada is right next to the United States, shares uh, many markets with the United States, but Canada regulates its banks from the standpoint of leverage much more tightly than the US. Uh, and it's notable that there were no bank failures in the, in the, in the great crisis uh, in Canada. There were hundreds of, ba of bank failures in the United States. Uh, so regulation really does make a difference. But there are other kinds of regulation besides uh, leverage and minimum standards. Uh, you can, for example, put restrictions on derivatives. Remember, derivatives are ways of turning loans, mortgage loans, into other kinds of securities. Uh, they're a way of sharing risk so, so, so that uh, uh, the bank that made the loan uh, can share the risk of that loan with, with other investors. Uh, sharing risk can be a good thing, but uh, it, it also has a downside. If I'm the bank and I can transfer some of the risk that I'm facing to other uh, to other investors, well then, that encourages riskier lending on my part. So one, one thing we might do to discourage that riskier lending is to restrict derivative trading. And in fact, uh, in the United States, we have seen some restrictions placed on derivatives uh, since 2007-2008, and, 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 there's, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, Another thing we can, we can think of doing is regulating the size of banks. Now, I said at the beginning, um, I don't think that the too big to fail uh, phrase really is getting at the heart of the problem. Because um, the problem with big banks is not that they're too big to fail. If, if you look at the argument that I've been giving for how financial crises get started and what we can do to stop them, notice that the size of the bank didn't come into the picture at all. Several small banks failing has the same effects on the economy as one big bank failing. So it really doesn't matter from the, from the standpoint of the chain reaction whether we have a lot of little banks or, or a few small banks. Uh, so I, I disagree with the uh, too, too big to fail mantra. Uh, the, there is a problem with big banks, though, and, and, and the problem is this. Uh, I've said that there's an externality involved in uh, 
bank lending. Uh, banks, it, banks ignore the effect that they, ha that they have on other banks. They take too much risk. They take too much leverage. Uh, and in particular, banks don't have the incentive to diversify sufficiently because some of the effects of that diversification isn't on them, it's on, the, on these other banks. So uh, this is why big banks might be problematic. Uh, big banks might not diversify sufficiently, and so that makes them likelier to fail. Now, of course, small banks are, are also under-diversified, and that might make them more likely to fail, too. But you get, here, here's the point, you get some natural diversification if you break up a big bank and turn it into several small banks. Because once you've broken up the big bank, the different pieces are likely to do different things. So you get some diversification just by virtue of the fact that they're not all one bank anymore. Uh, that, no, I, I think that's a valid argument. It's not the argument that's usually made against big banks, though. It, the usual argument that's made about big banks is that they have to be bailed out. But sm the, the small banks do, too. OK, so I'm coming to the, toward the end of my talk. And let me, I hope by now, uh, I've more or less convinced you that we can understand the recent financial crisis, and in fact, we can understand all financial crises without appealing to irrationality or panic or greed or unethical behavior or derivatives that cannot be understood very well uh, or bankers' bonuses or this too-big-to-fail uh, mantra. Uh, my argument didn't depend on any of those. Uh, f from the standpoint of my argument, um, the crisis was brought on by, by an externality, the fact that uh, one bank's risk-taking affects other banks through leverage, and and there's some moral hazard, too, uh, where if I expect I'm going to get a bailout, that, in, that encourages me to behave in a riskier fashion. And as we saw, the solution uh, to this problem it is twofold. Uh, first, if the worst happens and we actually have a crisis, we're going to have to deal with it through bailouts. There, there really isn't a good option other than that, uh, because we don't want to have further bank failures. Uh, but the most important thing of all is, is regulation, uh, good regulation, where we, uh, we correct the externality and we also correct the moral hazard problem created by bailouts. Now, how do we get a well-designed regulation bailout package? Well, it's, it's, um, it's more a, an art than a science. We don't know what the magic leverage ratio is that will, that will make things safe. Uh, we don't want to reduce leverage uh, too much because that will limit the n number of good ideas that can be funded. Remember, I, leverage does serve a useful purpose, it, and it, it, it does promote growth. So to the extent that we clamp down on leverage, we are also clamping down on creativity. Uh, and, so we have to strike a balance between creativity and stability. Uh, 
it also has to be pointed out that you can't write your regulation uh, laws once and for all because banks tend to be very creative institutions themselves. Whatever laws you write, they will eventually find a way around. Uh, and then you have to rewrite the laws to, to, affect, to, uh, to reflect the new reality. Uh, I'm not sure that point uh, has fully sunk in. Uh, at least with American politicians. Uh, but um, there are some good e historical examples which show that um, which show that we do have a chance of getting the balance uh, right or at least close to right. And, 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 and that's one very good example is the period of 40 years from about 1940 to, to 1980. So this was in the aftermath of an even bigger financial crisis, which caused the Great Depression of the 30s. Uh, one result of that depression was to put lots of financial regulation into place. Now, some of that regulation was not designed very well. but 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 some of it was, uh, was very good indeed and, and, and got at just the kinds of points I was making uh, to, to limit leverage. Uh, during that period, it's notable that there were very few financial crises. There was a very stable time financially and also a time of considerable economic growth. So at least for that golden period of 40 years, we got things right. Now, um, after 1980, I'm afraid that the memory of the Great Depression had faded sufficiently and things had been stable for long enough that somehow people believed that there weren't going to be financial crises anymore. And so gradually we saw the regulations eliminated, or even when they weren't eliminated, uh, innovative banks worked their way around them. So we now have a huge shadow banking sector, uh, which are not covered by much regulation at all. That all that's all post-1980. Uh, we. Um, we should remember this period of, of, of 40 years and remember that if we ignore it, we're asking for, we're asking for trouble. So uh, in the end, I'm not arguing that we can get rid of financial crises and, and to get rid of financial crises might involve overly strict regulation anyway. We, uh, but we can certainly reduce the probability of uh, financial crises a lot better than we've done, and we can also reduce the severity of financial crises a lot better than we've done. Um, and with that optimistic remark, um, I will stop and thank you for your attention. <laughs>